And welcome to the Back Reef, folks. I'm Rod Rodriguez, and I have with me the wonderful, the amazing Elizabeth Howe, one of our reporters here at Connecting Bets. Elizabeth, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Rod? Not too bad. It's weird calling you Elizabeth because you are Libby Howe. We know you as the Libby, the Libster. Um, Eliminator. The Eliminator. We will, I'm going to let go of a couple other ones that we see behind your back, but it's whatever. Um, Tell me a little bit about uh, your story this week. There's a lot going on in veteran news this week. Um, before we jump too far in, this is Suicide Prevention Month, folks. So this is one that's kind of near and dear to me. Um, if you're thinking about it, and I'm going to put it out there in the beginning, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll say this again at the end. Um, if you are thinking about suicide, don't fucking do it. You heard it right here, folks. Don't fucking do it, all right? Call a friend, call a family member, uh, call a priest, knock on your neighbor's door. Shit, man. I am on Twitter, uh, Rod Pod Rod. Hit me up, email me, call somebody. Don't fucking do it. Um, we've lost too many, and this has been kind of a rough week for stuff like that. So um, that's out of the way. Folks, we love you. Don't be crazy. Don't, be, don't do crazy things. Miss Libby Howe, what is on your plate? So I've been working for a few weeks now on a longer article on military training accidents because we had a couple of those more high profile ones recently. There was the AAV accident at Camp Pendleton that killed eight Marines and a sailor. So that one was garnering a lot of, a lot of national news. And then there was a helicopter crash also in California that killed two special ops soldiers. So it's not new. Training accidents are not a new phenomenon. These are by far not the first two even this year. But there's just a lot that we don't know about trends in military training accidents, um, whether they've really been increasing in recent years, what generally causes them. And so I did a little bit of digging and what I really found was that we don't know. Like we don't have the answers to a lot of the questions that we have on military training accidents. And there's currently a GAO investigation ongoing to kind of remedy that, to help us standardize data gathering procedures across the force so that we have the data to analyze those trends and see where the systemic problems are that are leading to these accidents. But that investigation is not done yet. And so there's kind of a, we're in a, a holdover, so to speak, um, until, until that investigation is completed. And those policies can be put in place because right now we just don't know a lot of the questions that we have about these trends. So walk me through some of the, the numbers. Cause you know, we talked about this about a week ago and you, you, you brought up a statistic that kind of uh, put me back a little bit. And it was in reference to the numbers of folks that have died from accidents versus those that have died in combat. Uh, you know, walk me through that a little bit. Yeah, so it was actually a House Armed Services Committee document um, that was put together by members of the House Armed Services Committee for the National Defense Authorization Act. They were asking for more funding, um, more funding for training, more funding for training flight hours, more funding for training programs, because in 2017, nearly four times as many service members died in training accidents as were killed in combat. So almost four times more died in training accidents than combat in 2017. And that's kind of a statistic that a lot of people point to, to illustrate, like there are way more training accidents than should be happening right now. And that, that trend has continued to increase, not significantly so, but it's still a lot of service members dying in non-combat related situations. Um, and so at the time, Congress was asking for more money for training and training programs so that maybe we could mitigate some of those, some of those accidents and deaths. It's startling, um, the number of folks that are dying during training. What, what, what does your instinct tell you? What, do, what is the, you know, you're out there, you're investigating this stuff. What is your initial reaction to some of this? It, that this is a problem. Of course, you see that number four times higher. It's very, it seems startling. Like these service members are joining the military to protect the country. 
from foreign enemies and they're dying on American soil in training situations that should be safe, that should be controlled. So that's very much my initial reaction. Like this is a huge problem. How come there's not more on this? How come we haven't been looking into it? So, and then I talked to actually the individuals from the GAO who are working on the ongoing investigation and it's just way more complicated um, than it would seem on the surface. So yeah, there are service members dying in training accidents. We had one yesterday, a paratrooper from Fort Bragg died during an airborne training incident. But that number that everyone cites, the four times higher in 2017, the DOD isn't collecting data the right way. So we don't know how many of those deaths were training accidents and how many of those were car accidents. How many of those were accidental overdoses? How many of those were other sorts of accidents? So wait, how, what do you mean they're not collecting this correctly? I mean, uh, you would, my, my, my intuition here says if I'm going to collect data, I should probably make separate buckets for accidents, car accidents, medical accidents. I mean, how are they collecting the data? Well, and there's all of these gray areas. So. From what I found in the few weeks that I've been digging, the Army does a decent job of it. The Army every week puts out a report on um, fatalities week to week. But their charts include, like if a, if a soldier was driving to work and died in a car accident, what type of fatality does that count as? Was that an on-duty fatality because they were driving to their place of work, they were driving to duty, or was that an off-duty fatality? And the people that I talked to from the Army about this, it is the categorization is inconsistent, the Army is huge, we're trying to track a lot of these deaths. And so part of the GAO investigation is recommending to really drill into that data get the categorization systems that we need so that we can see like, there are this many aviation, they call them mishaps, aviation mishaps happening at Camp Pendleton. There's a systemic problem at Camp Pendleton versus there are this many vehicle accidents around Fort Bragg, but that's not from the army, that's from everyone driving away from Fort Bragg because who wants to be at Fort Bragg on the weekend? So it's all of these vehicle accidents that have nothing to do with trading or service. So we just don't have that type of nuanced data. But my, the part where I kind of broke with what GAO was saying was, I understand that we need that specific categorized, categorized data to understand the problem, but this has been a problem for a very long time. Like, it is a problem. There is no question that it is a problem. Sure, we need the data to better understand the problem, but is there nothing that we can be doing in the meantime to minimize the number of training accidents that we have. So what's next? So this GAO investigation is going to come out. Um, are people already talking about some mitigating factors or maybe uh, some plans of action that they're going to take based on whatever these numbers come out? So what's interesting is that two years ago in 2018, the GAO did a very similar investigation that was focused on aviation mishaps. So everything that involved planes and the ongoing investigation is into ground combat mishaps. So if you look at the 2018 aviation investigation, the DOD has implemented some of the recommendations from that investigation. So moving forward, if the last investigation is any, any indicator, this most recent GAO investigation will come out and the DOD will implement um, recommendations the GAO was hesitant to confirm that these recommendations will be the same as the recommendations from the aviation one two years ago, but it, it's reasonable to think that they will be similar. And the recommendations from the aviation one were exactly what we've been talking about. Standardized data collection, categories that kind of cover the gambit of everything that goes on so we can really understand the trends. And those have been implemented for aviation mishaps. Um, as we all know, it takes the DOD years to decide they have enough data to really make any sort of policy decisions or changes. So we haven't seen, um, haven't seen those changes on the aviation side, but moving forward, that's probably what we can expect to see once this ground combat investigation comes out. 
Well, let's see. Um, I'm always concerned because, you know, uh, I hate to bring up Fort Hood again because Fort Hood has been taking such a beating. Um, and it, maybe rightfully so. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we did. I remember a couple of years ago, uh, you know, uh, a moving accident. It was a training accident. I think it was at an LMTV, went upside down in some water, uh, killed some soldiers, hurt some others. But training accidents are something that we have had to deal with in the military for so long. And a lot of folks have tried to raise flags about like, hey, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. I myself have been in a couple of training situations where I was like, uh, this, <laughs> this is a little hinky, man. This, is, this might not bode well for us. Thank God every situation we've, we've come out uh, on top. We never lost anybody. We, we've had a couple of training accidents. But I know that there's going to be some folks that are going to argue that the military itself is not a occupation for the weak minded or the weak bodied or even for those who are risk averse. Um, everything we do is, is a risky situation. We go out into the range, bullets are flying. We jump out of a plane. Well, we're jumping out of a goddamn plane. Um, but nevertheless, there, there, there are certain safety precautions that should be taking place. But at the same time, I also don't want that to take I don't want to say safety should take precedence over training, but at the same time, there has to be a happy medium. There has to be a place where we're like, yes, we're doing risky training and that, that training is going to benefit us as war fighters versus we're going to do some haphazard, you know, crazy shit. And, you know, hopefully no one dies. So, and that's why I think that this investigation is, of course, important because one of those Fort Hood ones pretty recently, I think it was last year, was, um, and we all know that the command climate at Fort Hood has taken, taken some shots right now, but it was a leader at Fort Hood who disregarded the amount of training that this specialist was supposed to have received. He was supposed to have six hours of behind the wheel instruction, this, that, and the other thing. He was supposed to have been through this course and leadership within his unit disregarded those policies and stuck him in this Bradley and he died. That is what this investigation, I think, will hopefully turn up. We will have very systemic standardized ways of reporting. So you can see like all of these accidents happened at Fort Bragg because you have hundreds of people jumping out of planes every week and they're going to be unavoidable accidents, right? Like you said, this is the military, this is what happens. The GAO investigation will identify situations where that's the case versus situations where it's a leader at Fort Hood who is disregarding rules that are in place for a reason. And right now the data doesn't exist to identify those trends and identify those systemic problems is what the GAO individuals kept saying. Systemic problems that have systemic solutions and you can't identify those systems without the data to analyze. So I 100% think that being in the military, training for combat, training for military service comes with risks and there's never going to be a zero risk situation within the military, but there are situations where risk could certainly be mitigated if leaders follow the rules. I remember my first duty station was in Bobenhausen, Germany. Uh, brand new Joe, just got there, went to the motor pool for the fir first time in the motor pool. First time, like I am brand, I'm like, hey, wow, trucks, this is kind of cool. I show up and they're like, hey, Rodriguez, get in, uh, get in the, uh, the oh, God damn, what is that thing called? Um, the troop carrier. 577. It was a 577 track vehicle. And uh, I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Like to get in the driver's seat. I'm like, okay. And I get in the driver's seat and it's got two laterals, two sticks. I didn't know what I was doing. And they're like, they showed me how to turn it on. I'm like, okay. Put a helmet on me. I'm like, okay. You're going to drive this down to the wash rack. I'm like, okay. Drove it down to the wash rack. I got a guy in front of me. So there's a guy in front of me and behind him, a wall, a freaking like concrete wall. And he's like, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. I'm like, okay. He's like, stop. I'm looking down and I'm like, where's the brake pedal? Cause nobody showed me how to drive this damn thing. Nobody gave me any instruction. And he's like, stop, stop, stop. And I'm like, ah, and somebody yells, pull the laterals back. And I'm like, Gah! and the whole thing goes lurching back and forth. And one of my NCOs ran inside the, the, he was inside the, the track, but he runs up to me behind the thing and he pulls the laterals back to the lock. 
and he's yelling at me and I'm like, oh, I'm doing it. I'm stupid private. Um, nobody asked, hey, do you know how to drive this thing? The, the assumption was brand new soldier or a new soldier. They thought I had PCS there or I don't know what the hell they were thinking. Uh, but it was my fault that I didn't know how to drive a track vehicle. Uh, but that was back in 2000. That's right, folks. I am that old. Um, but yeah, that I, I, you know, this is a history of, of maybe some negligence, maybe some cutting corners, but eventually these things will catch up with you. So for sure, uh, I'm interested in seeing what that report uh, says when it comes out. I want to talk about another story. Uh, you were talking a little bit about the Army isn't done thinking about renaming its installations honoring the Confederacy. Uh, this story, this subject continues to be on people's minds. This is directly uh, connected to the upcoming elections. Uh, there is a lot of, <laughs> to say that the controversy, there, it, to say there is controversy right now between the current administration, the elections, and the military is, uh, that's an understatement in light of the recent losers and uh, suckers uh, report. I, again, I, I've said it before, I'll say it here as well. I wasn't there. I don't know what the man said, the president. I don't know what the president said. We're getting reports of what was said. I don't know, man. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but what we do know is that there are forts named after Confederate soldiers. We do know that for a fact. That is, they're, they're there. And the president, and I'm looking at your, your, uh, your article here. He said, quote, I don't care what the military says. I'm supposed to make the decision, Trump said in a Fox News interview regarding renaming installations named for Confederate officers. I'm not going to go changing them. Um, he is the president. Can he do that? We never actually figured that out. I think we've actually talked about that before. Who, because, you know, he's at the very top of the military's chain of command. It is, is it? I don't even know. And you know what's interesting is Secretary of Defense Mark Esper has kind of shirked this issue off onto Secretary of the Army Ryan McCarthy. Uh, you ask Esper questions about this issue in the recent months. He has deferred questions to McCarthy and the Secretary of the Army, which seems interesting. It's kind of like, this is not my problem. I'm going to let you guys deal with this. Um, Esper has been butting heads with Trump on his his own his own agendas and his own different issues, which we have, of course, been paying pretty close attention to. But I think that these, the issue of the Confederate installations is going to, it's kind of quieted down a little bit. It's not been in the headlines nearly as much this month as it was in previous months. And I think it's gonna resurface pretty aggressively as the NDAA continues to work its way through um, Congress because Trump has made it so clear that I'm not going to pass any version of the NDAA that includes provisions to change the names of those installations. And the NDAA still has those provisions in it. So I'm, this, is, this is going to come to a head as the NDAA develops. Um, but it, it was interesting because we haven't heard very much about that issue recently. And then it was this week or last week that it came up again in an interview with General James McConville. So it quieted down, we're kind of led to believe that this has been brushed under the rug and then it resurfaces. We're not done with this issue yet. And I think it's going to, it's gonna come back. This is an issue that a lot of our listeners and our readers are very passionate about. Um, some passionate to the point where they're, uh, that's a dog wearing a diaper in case anybody's watching the video, uh, that is a puppy wearing a diaper, adorable adorable but if you're listening congratulations you just now know i want you to hopefully you envision the dog wearing a diaper but nevertheless uh, our listeners have definitely been very vocal about the situation about you know whether or not to change these names there's a lot of passion involved in here um i didn't really care either way i mean i didn't know who bragg was before didn't really affect my life but um, this has been an issue that's been brought to the forefront. And I think Millie uh, actually brought up some general Millie. Like, I know this dude. Like, yeah, me and Millie hang out on the weekend. What up, bro? Um, but he did bring up some interesting points about, you know, these – I think it was Millie. I want to say it was Millie. 
uh, these names being associated to soldiers, uh, service members that would be considered traitors that did uh, throw the union under the bus, so to speak. They chose a side. That that side didn't quite make it. Why are we honoring? That's you know, there's a lot to it, and I know some of our southern listeners, southern readers, are probably going to take some issue with you know, uh, Confederate soldiers being considered traitors. But I mean, I I feel like the general made an interesting point. That was I maybe we shouldn't be having this conversation because I think we have the exact same opinion on it is that I, and I, I don't really care either way. And unfortunately I tried to empathize a little more and think about a situation that would be similar for me, who is an individual in history that I find particularly divisive or offensive. And if I had to live somewhere that was named after that individual, and I just couldn't relate that much. And the, it was interesting because McConville said in that interview this week or last week that he, speaking to soldiers, there are some who have a very emotional reaction to the names of those installations. So McConville has interacted with soldiers who have a strong opinion about it, but he also said that on the flip side, there are a lot of soldiers who are completely unaware that the installation where they serve was named after anyone. And it wasn't just a name that was picked. But that same, and that was at the beginning of July when General Milley made that comment. But that was the one that really resonated with me and kind of the, the bandwagon that I've hopped into since, which, I don't know, Mark Milley's bandwagon seems to be a good place to be in general. Seems like a spot. That's interesting though, because uh, what I'm seeing is, is a huge division, that's a huge rift that's being uh, slowly widening between uh, the administration and these top military leaders. Uh, just recently, President Trump came forward and, and, and you know, just kind of dropped a, a small critical bomb on these folks, basically saying that they're all interested in making wars and they're just, in, in not so many words, the high, <clears throat> The higher ranking folks are making my life a lot harder to deal with. They're, tra- they're, they're making my job harder to do because they're focused on different priorities than me, the president. Um, but I think he followed that up with, but the other Joes, the, the other non-brass, they get it. And I, I was curious, you know, as you're doing these investigations, as you're, as you're investigating some of these stories, um, what does that rift look like? Is, is that is that rift actually occurring? Is this like uh, is this real? So I feel like I am not old enough, nor specifically educated enough to make this statement. But it seems like this is a rather unique relationship going on between top military personnel and the presidential administration. Again, from my very limited experience, um, it just seems like the top military leaders are being less and less filtered, less and less careful to make sure that they are on the president's side or at least appear to be. And that's just from my observation from doing this coverage. It was similarly interesting that that Atlantic article that came out last week before Labor Day that blew everyone's mind where Trump said that he didn't want amputees and parades and he didn't want to visit that cemetery. The four defense officials who were anonymously quoted in that article, there was a lot of talk about should those generals have identified themselves. Um, from the journalism point of view, there was a lot of argument that like journalists need anonymous sources and by extension, the public needs anonymous sources. We need anonymity because otherwise we wouldn't know any of these things. But there is still is just such, it's such a complicated relationship because, because those top military officials, whether they're retired, they have a lot to risk even after service by coming out against an administration that... Um, seems to have wronged the military in various ways. We know where I stand politically. Um, 
I do not think that this administration is on the side of your garden variety military troop, your lower level, lower level enlisted. I don't think that this administration thinks um, thinks in terms of how its decisions affect troops. And I do not judge these top military officials for some of the actions that they've made, even Esper and Millie coming out very blatantly and saying, the president said this, I'm saying this. But it is just such a complicated relationship. It, it is. It is a complicated relationship. Now, you know, again, I, I kind of fall on the side of I just don't know. Um, I'm a huge believer that what you believe and what you think can be very different from the decisions you make as a leader. Um, I've worked with a lot of different folks. Uh, I've worked with folks that were in high level positions that had personal beliefs that were dramatically different from mine, even to the point that one could consider offensive. Uh, I knew what they thought, I knew what they believed, but they nevertheless conducted themselves professionally when they were in uniform. They did, they never made a decision that I could point to point at and go, ah, you're this or you're that. It was like, oh, well, that's pretty fair. That's pretty cut and dry. Um, I, I don't know what to think about. I really don't have, I, I feel like there's too many factors going on. And to your point, when it comes to anonymous sources, when it comes to reporting, maybe back in the day, anonymous sources were great because you could get to those, those stories that otherwise would never be told. But the problem today is that there are so many voices, so many avenues that we're, that we're receiving messages from and that we revealed some of these avenues are fake we know that there is uh foreign influence we know that there are russian bots we have we've re i mean there's dumb number of doc anybody that wants to argue with me that the russians and the chinese and you know every other you know major country isn't trying to interfere with our business is insane um num number of documentaries and just standard operating procedure this is what you do but when you're dealing with anonymous sources and then you're dealing with sources that are obfuscating who they really are, it's so hard to, to understand, well, what's true? You know, how can I separate the anonymous source from the Atlantic from the anonymous source from Atlantic.co yeah, <laughs> that you're going to see on your Facebook page that their, their logo is just slightly different from the Atlantic. Um, you know, it, there, there's so much noise and, well, uh, you know, where I, that's where I journalistically, I understand the, the merits of anonymity and anonymous sources and being able as an institution to use those sources as an individual. I personally don't doubt that Trump did those things and said those things. And I have a lot of right leaning individuals in my life who have completely disregarded that Atlantic article because it was anonymous. And I can't blame them for saying like, these are anonymous sources. We don't know what was really said. And I can't argue with that. Like they're anonymous. They didn't go on record. There's not a lot of accountability for, for what they said. And it's for that reason, I want to take away that, that, smoke screen of anonymity. I want these former defense officials to take one for the team and go on record so that it's much harder to dispute these statements that they're claiming the president said, because as long as you've got anonymity, you can say like. But, it, it, but, but the problem with that is, and, and this isn't just a right problem, it's a left problem too, is that the minute somebody comes forward and says, I, Rod Rodriguez, heard the president say this. Well, whatever I say, whether it's positive or negative, the opposing side is going to disregard me as a kook, as uh, politically motivated, angry, disenfranchised, crazy, while those who support my claim or, or support my, my report are going to label me as a hero, as a whistleblower, uh, put this guy up on the pedestal here. That's the problem is that no, even if 
general so-and-so comes forward, someone's going to say that, oh, he's just, he's got, he's angry with the president or he's lying. He's, you know, whatever. And the, the ugly side to that, I think the even uglier side is that don't make shit up. The, uh, whatever side, it's true, right? So whoever it is, if I'm saying pro-president, anti-president, the other side is going to make some shit up like, did you know Rod Rodriguez is a pedophile? Like, what? No, 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 no. What? I'm not. Also, that has nothing to do with what I just said about the president. What the hell are you talking about? It's People make shit up just to slam you, just to discredit you. So I'm not even sure that coming forward wouldn't make that much of a difference. That would also be nice if people just couldn't lie. Isn't there a movie about that? I'm pretty sure there's a movie where everyone just can't lie. And I feel like that's kind of what we need right now as an administration. And I would, there is a degree. And it, if you can put a name to those senior defense officials, I feel like you do have a little more of a, I don't want to say argument because we don't have to argue about everything. But oh, yes, we do. We have to argue about everything. Everything is a fight. If you can put a name on some of those defense officials that are quoted in the Atlantic article, like if one of those people was Mark Milley, which I don't think it was, but if it was Mark Milley, man, I will follow General Mark Milley off a cliff. If he says that this happened, I'm going to believe that this happened. Um, but look what happened. Okay, so that's a great point. I like Milley. I think I like Milley. Nobody's told me not to like Millie yet. Um, but look what happened with Mattis. You know, we, that, that's some cracks about. We were on the Mattis train. Mad Dog 2020, baby. Everybody was like, he's the new Secretary of Defense. Yeah, everybody was all about it. And then they weren't. <laughs> Just like that. He was a piece of shit. Uh, one of the worst military leaders. I literally saw, like, I, I, I don't want to bust anybody out on, on, over here, but I know, you know who you are. You know who you are on my Facebook folks. You know who you is. The same dudes that were like four or five years ago, like I love St. Mattis, the, the, the God of war, same dudes. A couple years later, fuck Mattis, worst army, worst Marine general ever. I served under him and he kicked the puppy to death. And I, I tried to stop it. He was a horrible human being. Like, I'm like, what, what? I mean, the world turned on this dude hard. And honestly, I haven't heard much from Mattis since his own Atlantic debacle or revelation or whatever you want to call it. So I worry about that. Like, I mean, how fast will we turn on Millie? How fast will we turn on uh, Esper's, you know, Esper's Secretary of Defense, whatever. Um, but I mean, how fast will people turn on those that they look up to right now until, I hate to say it, till they're told not to look up to them. Which is why military personnel are supposed to remain apolitical. And I don't know if we're doing that great of a job of that right now in this country. <laughs> is anybody doing a great job of being apolitical? Is no. anybody? I there, there are people that I see like they're, you know, when uh, they go on news shows, they have the little thing down here and their name and they're like political commentator. I've even seen stuff like, you know, uh, uh, moderate. I know there. And then they say stuff that's completely not moderate. And I'm like, what? You're moderate, bro. Um, the last thing I want to talk with you about is uh, the suicide of Ronnie McNutt. Uh, he is the army veteran who, just recently, I think this week, um, killed himself on Facebook Live. Um, and, you know, he had a heartbreaking message before he killed himself. Um, this is a guy who is an Army vet who needed help. He, he This was a huge – I think this is probably one of the most public – uh, military suicides just from the gruesomeness. I mean, I'm like, let's not mince words here. Uh, I believe he blew his head off with a shotgun um, on Facebook Live while people were trying to get him to stop. Um, I didn't see it. I'm not going to see it. I, I don't need to see that, man. I, I, I don't need that. I've got enough. Uh, I, I got enough in my, my, my noggin floating around. I don't need to see that. But 
there's a couple of things here that bother me with this. One, that he did it. it kind of goes back to my message at the beginning of the show. Don't fucking kill yourself. For the love of God, please don't fucking kill yourself. It's not worth it. Nothing's going to be solved. Um, the other part to this that bothers me is the way that his, his death is being used. Um, a lot of folks are hiding his, his, I keep saying murder, his suicide inside of videos where like, I think somebody put it on TikTok to like, hey, really cool way to cook spaghetti. And the guy starts off with like, first what you're gonna do is an eclipse to the moment he, he pulls the trigger. And I know a lot of kids are being traumatized. A lot of parents are talking about this. There's a lot of anger right now at social media, uh, such as TikTok and YouTube and Facebook, because some folks are saying that they're not trying hard enough to take this down and they're actually using it to, <laughs> they're using it to gain new subscribers. <laughs> like I'm, I'm a little, I'm not sure how that works. Like, hey, you want the best sub suicides come to YouTube? Like, I don't get it. But um, tell me a little bit about what you're, what you've been tracking on this and uh, what, what, what do you see is happening right now with this? First of all, down with TikTok, that has been causing so many problems for the active duty community. And now this TikTok is toxic. We should just down with TikTok. But it is, um, it's just such a complicated situation because you want the awareness. You want awareness of the veteran suicide problem. And you know us, Connecting Vets, We've been on this beat for, I've been at Connecting Vets since 2018. It's been more than two years and I've written more articles about veteran suicide than I can count. So it's just such a complicated issue because we want the awareness. You want the general public to be aware that like suicide is a problem for everyone. Veterans are dealing with just that little bit more PTSD, this more depression, the isolation. It's even more of a problem within this community. You want that awareness, you, at what cost? At what cost do we want to bring this awareness? I don't understand TikTok. I don't understand people's motivation for doing certain things on social media in that type of public arena. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, so I can't speak to whether I think I can't, I don't even have an opinion on if I think it was right for him to do this on a live stream or not. If he thought about the consequences of what was happening, if he thought about how far it would spread and how, how videos on the internet spread, I can't even speak to if that crossed his mind at all, what the motivations were. But it's, I think that the best thing that we can do is continue to raise awareness about, hey, this video is floating around, don't watch it, but we need to continuously pay attention to the suicide crisis within the veteran community. I, you know, you bring up a great point and that's, it, it, oh man, we're going to get some heat for that. And, and that, but that's good because this is opening dialogue. You're going to commit suicide. Do you do this on Facebook live? And if you do, why, what is your motivation to do this? on Facebook Live, knowing that this is going to be captured for ever. I don't want anybody to commit suicide. Um, and I'll share this with you and I'll share this with our audience. I've been there. Uh, I've, I've had my own personal demons and there was a point where I, in my mind, I thought this was the most logical thing to do. And there was a point in my mindset, in my thinking, that I had set up like this, a tripwire. And I, I, I encourage my veterans and my service members and my civilians, don't think we forgot about you guys out there. Just because we have our bullshit we got to deal with doesn't mean you don't have your bullshit you got to deal with. We all carry a rucksack. But I set up this like mental tripwire in my brain, I think, or in my, my, I don't know, unconsciously, consciously that said the moment suicide seems normal, like this is a viable fucking option for me. 
I need to do something. I need to call somebody. I, I was driving uh, from Colleen to Waco for, for work. And I, it, it just made sense in my brain. Like something in there clicked and I was like, this just makes sense. I just need to end this. I pulled over and I called my mom. And man, thinking about it right now. Um, I called her and I didn't tell her what was wrong with me, but I just needed to talk. And she knew something was wrong and we talked. Got back in the car, drove to work, went through my day, went home and called some friends and we talked about it. And that was, it was my friends that I openly like, this is going through me. Everyone was like, don't fucking do this dude. Um, but what, what hurts me the most about this McNutt situation is that his family can see this, you know, your friends can see this. This is something you don't want to pass on, dude. It's bad enough that you died, but to, to put that out there, it, it just seems gruesome. It seems more painful. Um, is it making, uh, but, but we're talking about it. And to your point, I thought that we were done with awareness, that we needed to go into um, some type of interventions. Like maybe we need programs to stop this thing from happening. But awareness, I mean, I thought we knew. I thought everybody knew. I thought everybody understood that, you know, veteran suicide was a real thing and that we needed to, to stop this. But I'm, I'm hearing a, more and more voices coming forward from this video saying, I didn't know it was this bad. I, I don't know. I mean, are we at a point now where we need more awareness or is it programs to stop it? I don't know. What are your thoughts? I think that there are so many questions in this situation specifically and with the veteran suicide crisis in general that we don't have the answers to because no one is talking. No one is talking until it is too late. And so we won't know the motivations. We won't know what he was looking for doing this on a live stream. And now we probably never will, unless there's a secret note somewhere, there's a secret diary somewhere, there's something written somewhere. Talking, to say that talking is important seems superficial, seems like a throwaway comment, seems like a, like, uh, sticking a Band-Aid on a much bigger problem that you need to talk to someone, you need to reach out, you need to talk. But in all of the years that I've been covering, all of the years, I'm 26, in all of the years that I've been covering the veteran suicide crisis, that is what it keeps coming back to. These sophisticated programs that the VA is rolling out, these the, the expensive initiatives, the, the lip service, the all of it, we're not talking. We don't know that there's a problem until it's too late to know that there's a problem. And that has been the case forever. And it's not an easy problem to solve. It's a cultural problem. We live in a culture, the military more so than in general, we're in a culture where you rub dirt in it and move on. Specifically in the military, within the country in general, rub some dirt in it, move on, which is ironic because we are, as a culture, over sharers of a lot of things that I really don't want to see, but not when it comes to mental health issues. And it's a cultural problem that needs to shift, just like racism, just like sexual assault in the military. The culture around mental health in the military is toxic and it follows people out of the military. And it's going to come back to talk, 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 talk. But, you know, that's the thing. I think a lot of vets, and I think a lot of people, and I keep saying vets because, you know, we, we don't talk about caretakers. We don't talk about uh, the folks that are trying to care for those who have been wounded, those who are incapable uh, now of taking care of themselves, the caretakers. Those folks are at risk because they're being depleted mentally and physically and spiritually. And they feel that the moment they express their pain or they express their frustration, they're bad people because, you know, what about this guy that got hurt or this girl that got hurt? So, I worry about them a lot. Um, 
when it comes to talk, and I want to clear that up, folks. Talking doesn't mean it's fixed. That's not what we're saying. That's not what anybody's saying. I think that maybe we need to say that. That when we say call somebody, I talked to my mom. She didn't fix my problems, man. Nobody fixed my problems. I still got my problems. They're not going to go away. It doesn't, it's not like, um, it's not like COVID. It's, okay, I got it for two weeks. Now I'm fine. It doesn't work that way. This is something that you're going to carry around with you forever. And there's going to be some days that are, you'll, you won't even think about it. And some days, you can't stop thinking about it. You can't stop thinking about the things that are pushing you to the edge. But the fucking talking thing, man, when you talk to somebody, it's like hitting that pressure valve. Sometimes you just need to hit the pressure valve and let that steam out and go, I got room to let that pressure build back up. But I got room. I got time. You go, do your shit, and then you hit that pressure valve again and again and again. That's okay. That's okay. I'm okay with that. And I hope you're okay with that. And if anybody tells you otherwise – or there's this weakness that, that you know, you're talking about, Libby, that people are like, you know, I actually, you, with some Sergeant Major was like, you know, have a tamp, put a tampon in your thing. And I think there was this whole contract, like put a tampon in your, in your front breast pocket. Uh, like, dude, what kind of bullshit is that? You know, we have Sergeant Majors now killing themselves. We have, and that's the thing, like suicide doesn't care about your rank, man. And they don't care about if you're a special forces guy or a cook supply dude, uh, suicide, ide suicide ideation, suicide thoughts, don't give a fuck about your rank, don't give a fuck about your political affiliation, don't give a fuck about anything, you know? Left, right, woman, man, in between, you know? Doesn't matter, dude, it's, it, 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 you know, if you need help, go get it. Um, like I said, you can reach out to me. I'm on Twitter, man, at Rod Pod Rod. I'm, you can reach out to Connecting Vets. Uh, we're, we're here for you. We're here to connect vets to the right resources, man. And sometimes you just need to talk, man. Sometimes you need somebody to just go, hey, it's okay. I, I, I hear you. I heard you. You, you are a person. Um, yeah, man. So that's it. Miss Libby Howe, how can people reach out to you? Where can we read about your stories and the stuff that you're doing at Connecting Vets? You can find my stories on ConnectingVets.com or on Twitter at ECB Howe. At ECB Howe, H-O-W-E. Folks, I'm Rod Rodriguez. As always, Twitter at RodPodRod. Rod. You can reach me. Um, on Twitter is the best place to go. That, honestly, God, that's the best way to reach me. Um, Folks, if you need help, call 1-800-273-8255, National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, you know, there's some great, I love podcasts, love podcasts, uh, obviously I make one. And uh, they did a great show about this prevention hotline and they've talked to some of the folks that, that uh, are on the other end of this. They're phenomenal. They're phenomenal people. Like, their job is to hear you out. Their job is not to, um, what's the quote? Oh, it's the idea of uh, uh, walk you back from the ledge. That's not what they're going to do. They're going to hear you, man. They want to talk to you. They just want to help you get through the next day, help you get to the right resources. And uh, yeah, man, that's it. 1 800 273 8255. I'm going to leave you with that. Um, that's it. That is the back brief. We will see you next week. I better fucking see you next week, you sons of bitches. Uh, I will see you next week, folks. Uh, you can always go to uh, connectingvets.com and you will get the latest and greatest in connecting in uh, connecting vets. Of course, it's connecting vets. Go to connectingvets.com. You're going to find the latest and greatest in veteran uh, related news. There's also some non veteran related news. We cover everything. So that's it. I will see you at the next episode. That's it. That's a wrap. Yeah. And we only saw the dog's diaper once. <laughs>